Hi, everybody. I see our numbers climbing as they always do when, when our agency colleagues come online. Um, very exciting today to have NSF, NASA, and NOAA program managers here with us to share updates from their respective agencies and also to take your questions. So I just want to share a slide here really quickly and, and then we'll introduce everybody. Can everybody see that? Great. So as I said, we have National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, we have Michael Siraki and Cynthia Suchman from Biological Oceanography. We have Hetty Edmonds from Chemical Oceanography. We have Mete Ouz from Physical Oceanography. From the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, we have Laura Lorenzoni from the Ocean Biology and Biogeochemistry Program. And from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, we have Dwight Gledhill from the Ocean Acidification Program and Kathy Tedesco from the Global Ocean Monitoring and Observation Program. And we're going to be setting a timer for 45 minutes for all of our presentations and updates from our agency colleagues here. And then we will set a timer for another 30 minutes for you all to enter your questions into the Q&A, which I will be moderating. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it off going to start with the NSF slides. Hetty, do you want, or Heather, do you want me to share? Yes, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Good to go. Yeah. Your slides and I can hear you. Okay. Um, this is Mike Saraki. I'm going to give the NSF update. And um, the first uh, part of this talk is about people. And I wanted to just give you a heads up on changes in personnel. Terry Quinn has been our division director for three years and he's agreed to continue for another year. So uh, Terry will be continuing on as our division director. He is a rotator. Um, we're welcome Morris Tyvee to section head for marine geosciences section. That's MG chemical oceanography. And Morris just started uh, last week in this position. And also Carl Castillo is a program officer from the, from the University of North Carolina and he is uh, running the our new postdoctoral fellowship program. Um, other updates in chemical oceanography, there's been a lot of turnover with Simone Metz retiring in February and Liz Kenwell rotated out. Kenshin Mati has rotated in and there are two uh, program director positions searches going on that are actually close to finishing. So there may be some announcements on new program directors in chemical oceanography coming up soon. In biological oceanography, we will be having searches underway very shortly for a new science assistant and for two rotators all within the next uh, nine months or so. If you're interested in a rotator program officer position, uh, let us know. Other news in uh, ocean sciences, our program, Biological Oceanography, went to a no deadline operating mode, and we are adjusting to that now, and things seem to have gone pretty smoothly. The community doesn't seem to uh, object too much to that, and we're finding our ways with our new processes on how to do that. Um, we have a new ocean science postdoctoral fellowship program that got initiated this year. Uh, proposals are in and selection process is under review and selection process is underway for that. One of the biggest news for this community is the GoBGC array was funded at $65 million. 
to deploy 500 BGC Argo floats over the next five years. And I'm sure you've all heard about that and we'll be hearing more about that as time goes on. Um, this, we expect uh, this kind of data coming in to be um, promoting lots of new proposals in uh, both chemical and biological oceanography. The OI Pioneer Array went through a decision process on where to relocate or whether to relocate. And the decision was made to move to the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And that will process will begin shortly and will happen over a course, I'm not sure, of one or two years. And we have a program, a new program called Coastlines and People uh, that has received proposals and uh, selection processes underway for those as well. So those are some of the um, new things happening. Um, people always are curious about the budget and um, so are we and that's why there are question marks up there because a lot of things are unsettled about next year's uh, NSF budget. Uh, a couple of things I want to say about that is that um, ocean sciences is pretty well positioned within NSF relative to the uh, climate uh, priority that the Biden administration has has stated. And if you want to learn more about how they're thinking at the highest levels of government that might eventually filter down to NSF, take a look at the um, U.S. Global Change Research Program strategic plan. So that seems to be guiding a lot of the thinking about how uh, the Biden administration will be focusing on climate change research. Uh, there's also a priority on equity and inclusion, and there's a lot of activity in NSF and across the federal government about how to deal with uh, racial inequities and systemic problems that we've had in our inability to improve diversity in the science workforce. So there will be new uh, idea programs coming and uh, ideas about that. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Um, also, the, the Senate and House are very interested in this new directorate for NSF. They're calling technology, innovation, and partnerships. And that is sort of, a, you might say, a knowledge to action kind of uh, way of thinking. And we don't know if there's going to be such a new directorate, but there has been um, action taken in those directions for a more um, uh, you might call it translational um, directorate in uh, NSF. So those are some of the things we're seeing on the horizon. Um, just one other thing I wanted to add is that the programs have been dealing with a lot of COVID uh, related impacts on projects, including uh, supplements. And we've put out a lot of uh, communication about how we're, how we're dealing with supplements. And we expect that supplements on on funded projects will probably can be continuing for the next couple of years in terms of impacts and we're really focusing on giving supplements only to projects that have had big impact and near the end of their funding so um, it's still a possibility beyond this year for covid supplements and uh, just stay in touch with your program officers about those kinds of impacts uh, the 10 big ideas are still around and, and thriving and new uh, initiatives are coming up in all of these areas. Five of them have been really particular to the ocean community. Um, and so I just want you to, if you're interested in these kinds of areas, uh, pay attention to the new solicitations coming out on those. Uh, the Go BGC array was funded out of the Mid-Scale Infrastructure Big Idea Program, for example. Um, regarding the uh, ship operations, the academic research fleet took a big hit in terms of number of operating days, but it did not go to zero. And um, you'll see, you see the uh, year 2020 here was primarily the pandemic year. Our um, operating days went almost to a half where they were, but the projected for 2021 is to be back up to 
uh, close to normal operations. There's still a backlog, backlog of crews needs for, for science projects. And so that becomes more of a scheduling uh, challenge and some delays are to be expected. So um, I think the uh, fleet, the ship operators and UNOLs did a fantastic job of maintaining operation of the fleet, no major outbreaks on any of our ships and um, working through a, a really dynamic and changing situation with the pandemic. Uh, given that things are changing quickly with the pandemic, UNOLS has updated its guidance June 4th. If you have research cruises coming up, you should pay close attention to that. There are changes because of the uh, high uh, rate of vaccinations occurring. So they're changing their um, policies on testing and quarantining and all the details are in the UNOLS um, updated COVID-19 guidance. So um, that's sort of a big picture, quick uh, survey of new things that have been happening at NSF this year, sort of an update. And uh, if you have questions, put it in the uh, Q&A chat and we will be collecting them and addressing them after uh, the three agencies give their presentations. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike Elliott, could you invite Laura back up to the stage, please? I think she had to sign in using a different computer. Uh, yep, Laura, we have you on stage, so you should be able to activate your camera and microphone now, the bottom of your screen there. Oh, I see another account for you here. I'm going to try to activate you She again. says she's not. Yeah, she signed in with her personal computer. Okay. I just invited the second account up. Hopefully that should work. Great. I'll go ahead and start. Go. I'll start sharing your slides now, Laura, so you can begin. Can't, we can't hear you, Laura. Are you? Can you hear us? It looks like you're muted. Mike, it sounds like her mic keeps shutting off. Yeah, I'm seeing that as well, Laura. If you wouldn't mind, hopefully you can hear us. Can you just try to refresh your browser really quickly and see if that solves the issue? We'll bring her right back, everyone. Sorry, stand by for the technical difficulties with her microphone here. Oh, is this any better? Yes. There we go. We can hear you now. Yay. So it, I mean, certainly my computer certainly did not want to join today. It it's it crashed. It locked me out. It did everything it could possibly do um, to you know. It, it just didn't want to be here. So I am sorry about that. Um, should I get started, Heather? Yes. Absolutely. You're good to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Good morning or afternoon, everybody. I'm Laura Lorenzoni. I'm with the Ocean Biology and Biogeochemistry Program at NASA headquarters. Um, and with me also is Joel Scott, um, who also works with Ocean Biology and Biogeochemistry at headquarters. We're delighted to be here. Um, we'll be providing you with a very brief update. Um, there are a lot of slides, a lot of information. These slides will be uh, posted, so you can go through them at your leisure. There are a bunch of links that you can also go back to. Um, and so hopefully this is going to be um, um, 
informative and, and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about the budget. Um, next slide, please. Um, we have, um, this is just a brief overview of what um, the F1, FY21 appropriations look like and what the FY22 requests and president's budgets look like. Um, much like other federal agencies, uh, the budget is very much promising. So this has been a, a positive turn that all the agencies have seen. Um, in um, FY21, uh, the appropriation for earth science was about 2.69 billion. Um, it provided the opportunity for NASA and especially Earth Science to continue to move forward a balanced portfolio. Um, and that also meant that PACE uh, mission remained funded, um, as well as all the other uh, ongoing program uh, of record uh, missions. Um, the FY22 request was a little bit higher. It was about 3.2 billion. Um, that budget prioritized um, advancement for the Earth system science to uh, address cl the climate crisis or the climate challenges, um, the promotion of uh, diversity and equity in science, much like we also heard from Mike in, NSF, in NSF's um, uh, presentation. Um, in general, um, uh, as, as a NASA as, as a whole, it also um, asked to keep, going, keep moving forward um, the Artemis science, which is a lunar exploration, um, and also lead forward a balanced, innovative, and open science program that would really enable um, access to not just data, but also um, other uh, programs or anything else that would really um, enable science across the board. Um, the president budget, which was released back in April, was very um, kind to all federal agencies. It did um, provide the 3.2, the 3 I apologize, there's a, there's a, um, a typo there and I'll correct it. Um, for earth science, and that was the 12% from FY21, and it also requested about 24.7 billion for NASA as a whole, which is about a 6% increase from FY21. Next slide, please. Um, what's changed? Um, actually, let's start with what's what's remained the same. Um, the, the support remains for all the on-orbit missions that uh, the agency has, including all the instruments that are on the space station. Um, it continues the support and the development for a variety of missions that are listed in the second bullet. Um, it also maintains a regular occurrence of the venture class solicitations, um, which are um, really enablers of, of bigger signs that we, we can do with our regular solicitations. Um, what has changed is that the budget for research uh, data systems has increased. Um, there is obviously support for PACE and Clear Pathfinder, which would um, get uh, regularly slashed in the previous administration's budget. Having said that, it always remains supported um, throughout the years, and so there has been no interruption in that. Um, it, uh, the new budget also funds Libera, which is uh, going to look at Earth's radiation budget. Um, so that's very exciting because it is the first Earth Venture continuity mission, um, and it addresses uh, a really critical climate question. Um, it additionally, it funds innovative science uh, for CubeSats and SmallSats, which is something that the agency has been looking at um, more. Um, um, and it augments uh, the budget for a variety of, um, of other missions. Um, hopefully, it also breaches uh, the gap of COVID-19 um, costs, as we heard from our colleagues. Um, it's been a tough year for many, um, and that also has obviously resulted in some um, additional costings um, as well as delays. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and so as we're talking about missions, let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, NASA maintains a healthy uh, fleet of ocean observing um, satellites and sensors on the space station. Um, this is a graphical uh, presentation of our missions across the years. Um, so those in green and blues um, are either, you know, past their operation, but they're still working or are um, have been recently launched and those in kind of yellow is yellowish and oranges are coming up um, and so as you can see there are more than 20 um, earth observing satellites that provides a wealth of information especially for the ocean um, that as scientists um, all of you use and we're really thrilled to see all the amazing science that you come up with next slide please the next actually big thing uh, actually let's talk about pace first um, so pace uh, remains um, on track the one thing to note, and PACE is, is, is our, it's, it's not only going to provide continuity for um, observing um, ocean ecosystems, but it actually is going to uh, push the way forward 
Um, and it remains on track, um, except that's been uh, there's been a little bit of a delay because of COVID. So centers were closed and folks weren't weren't able to actually get on site to work. So now the um, earliest launch day it has slipped to November of 2023. Um, there's more information about PACE on the website, so I'm not going to dwell on this. And we're going to go to the next slide, please, and talk about the next big thing that the agency has been advertising. Next slide. Um, which is the Earth System Observatory, um, and this is this is basically um, kind of a just of a rebranding of the designated ob observables that the uh, Decadal Survey um, put out in 2017. Um, so we have your ACCP, um, which is the, the clouds and the aerosol piece, the mass change, surface deformation and change, and then um, which is the most relevant for us, the surface biology and geology designated ob observables. So now they're um, kind of being packaged as the Earth System Observatory because they would enable um, at large to see how our Earth is functioning. Now that uh, starts from the premise that we would have this in orbit at the same time. It's not going to quite happen like that. Um, surface biology and geology has been approved to move to pre-phase A, so it's moving, it's moving along really well, just as um, the ACCP folks. Um, <clears throat> and the ACCP folks have also selected a LIDAR um, for um, uh, uh, an ocean capable lidar as one of their technologies and so that is really good news for for the ocean um, as it really is going to provide a great complement in terms of ocean observations um, if you click again um, if you're interested to learn more about the earth system observatory there's going to be a community forum on june 30th um, and that we'll share the link um, and i'll make sure that heather also has it on the website um, so that um, you can all participate and listen um, a little bit more about this next slide please now, the good thing about all of this that is happening is that for the ocean, it really does mean that we can see um, pretty much you know, across the whole, the whole range. So between um, the upcoming missions, the designated observables, which include SBG and ACCP, um, the geostationary um, sensor that is being developed, Glimmer, and PACE, we will be able to see um, the ocean pre pretty much across the board. So that is really exciting. Um, one thing that, that does concern us a little bit is what's going to happen in terms of continuity, um, but that is something that the agency has been thinking really hard. Um, and we want to make sure that we um, keep that climate record um, ongoing. Next slide, please. Okay, so that is um, what's happening in space. Let's talk a little bit about updates in terms of um, the science that OBB and NASA at large have been doing. Next slide. Um, I couldn't be prouder um, to say that Exports has completed its second field campaign despite the odds. Um, it was, it's was it been very challenging. Um, Exports was supposed to be out in the field last year um, to do their second and last field campaign. Um, because of COVID, we had to postpone it. Uh, but because of the really the determination of the scientists and our fantastic project office, um, they were able to go out in the North Atlantic um, throughout the whole month of May. So they've just returned home um, June 1st. Um, and they were really, they were able to capture um, the three different epochs that they were looking for in terms of, uh, that's okay, in terms of um, uh, characterizing and understanding uh, what carbon exports um, looks like in the North Atlantic. And then um, as, as the, the goal of the, of, the, of the whole project is to really characterize um, those different export mechanisms and then being able to link those to satellite remote sensing. So every, it is extremely exciting. Um, we have tons of data. Um, we're gonna be processing those data and those data are gonna be available and open to the entire community bef before we do anything else. And I'll talk about the next step of exports in a little bit. So now we can go to the next slide. Um, just because I'm so proud of our export scientists and, and crew and team. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's just a little bit of numbers. Um, folks had to quarantine for, for a long time. So in, in adding all everybody's quarantine up, um, it was over a thousand days of quarantine that they spent um, in a variety of places. Um, there were a ton of COVID tests, which um, if those of you that have taken them, you know how fun they are. Um, but it was um, it was really the team just just held together. We had a ton of um, autonomous deployments, lots of um, liters of water being filtered, um, and we had a bunch of birthdays. I think everybody just decided to have their birthdays um, while on ship because they had a fantastic cook. And the picture that you see there is actually a cake. It was one of the cakes that the um, one of the ship's uh, crew uh, made. Well, the cook made for the um, for the birthday girl. Um, and uh, we're really, really happy to have partnered with um, the National Oceanographic Center. They were 
um, they really enabled and helped us get out to the North Atlantic. So we're really grateful to them as well. Next slide, please. Oh, and um, I could not also, I need to thank our partners, NSF, because um, they are also uh, contributing with exports. So um, the two agencies are really, really proud of what the scientists have achieved. Okay, other updates. Um, we've, we've been talking about the advanced science plan for a while, and I'm really sorry we're still talking about it. Um, it's, uh, we really want to make sure that what we put out is, is really solid. It's something good. It's something that we can use for the next decade. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, a bunch of folks that I can't think enough, um, that are looking at it and looking at it with a critical eye. Um, and the, the plan needs to be updated to reflect everything that has happened over the past uh, few years since it was first drafted. Um, so we're really hoping to put out for community review, um, a draft towards the end of this year and actually have it finalized by the end of uh, 2021 calendar year. Um, we continue to contribute to SOCOM, and the reason I mention it is because, um, again, we're really, really proud of what SOCOM has achieved, and, and NSF really, it's, it's a fantastic investment that they've made, and we, we couldn't be happier to be able to partner with them and fund the optics on those floats. Um, and what that map represents is um, which floats have been deployed that have um, optics. And so we're really happy, we're happy the community is using those data um, and continue to encourage uh, that kind of collaboration. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, talking about that collaboration, and Mike mentioned the um, recent uh, support that they've provided to um, Biogeochemical Argo. Um, and again, we couldn't be uh, happier that NSF is giving um, our technology and scientists that opportunity, so thank you. Um, we just concluded the Biogeochemical Argo Fleet Workshop, which was really, really interesting. And the goal of that workshop was to try to link better the science to the application. Um, and so all those sessions have been recorded. If you're interested, there's a website, and so you can go there and listen to the different sessions. Um, a lot of work went into that, um, and uh, we're, we're really, really, really happy about how it turned out. So I encourage you to take a peek at that if you're interested. Next slide. We continue to work with the network of ocean worlds. It's completely out of this world. And if you're interested to learn more, um, I would encourage everybody to come uh, this thir this Friday on the 18th. Uh, we have a special session on ocean worlds. Um, and the idea of this collaboration is to really leverage on uh, what we're doing on Earth to not just understand how we can uh, look at life and oceans in other parts of our solar system, but how in that process we can also understand better um, our ocean here on Earth. Um, so we have a fantastic uh, lineup of plenary speakers. They've recorded their talks there on the website. I would encourage you to listen to them. Um, and then if you're interested in the panel discussion and our and to talk to our uh, panelists and speakers, please join us on Friday at 12.15. Next slide. Um, uh, one of the things that came out of the COVID um, situation, I guess, was a really nice collaboration across three space agencies, um, NASA, ESA, and JAXA. And they've created what uh, we call this, um, and I realized I didn't put the link in the website, and I apologize, I'll add that, um, a dashboard that illustrates uh, different um, indicators, and one of them is water quality. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, I would encourage you to take a look. It has um, air quality, water quality, and a variety of other indicators that are interested in its basically looking at how our planet reacted to um, basically a shutdown of human activities. And it's quite interesting to see the different, um, the, the different um, effects of each of the different indicators. Um, that um, dashboard has a hackathon, hackathon coming up at the end of June. Um, and then we're gonna have our Space Up Challenge in October. And what this is, that both of these events are inviting the broader community to come in and answer specific questions. So utilizing remote sensing data, um, programming models, um, you know, anything that they, they come up with, um, they can answer a variety of questions that include anything from like designing a game on a, a board game, um, doing some art or, you know, pretty much anything that the challenge uh, requires. So um, if you know of anyone that, that likes that kind of thing, um, this is it generally is really, really fun. Next slide, please. Um, other news, um, the dual anonymous peer review process that we've been talking about for a few years, it's still there. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this, this has started because uh, NASA really feels strongly about making sure that all our panels um, are judging proposals as objectively as possible. Um, it hasn't, we've, I think we've come to an agreement that some, um, 
some programs are good for dual animals per review. Some programs just can't enact them just because um, there's th there's a requirement to know the expertise of certain um, proposers. Um, but that is still ongoing, so it certainly is an activity that NASA has not put to the side. Uh, NASA continues also to collect information about which proposals are high risk or high reward and high impact. Um, and that is basically a check mark on your um, cover sheet. So whenever you're filling out your cover sheets, um, you're going to find that question. Um, it doesn't it doesn't give you any added advantage. It's just the metric that we're using internally um, or disadvantage. Let me put it that way. Um, another thing that probably everybody has um, has heard about is that we established or the agency established a new position of senior climate advisor. They've um, selected an acting uh, person right now, which is Gavin Schmidt. He was the director of GIST, um, and so for now, he'll be that uh, senior climate advisor until a permanent person um, is assigned, and this is in response to the also the administration's priorities on climate. Next slide. Um, we've had a bunch of recent selections. I'm not going to go through them. The slides are here, but it's been a really, really busy year, and I'm sure the community has felt it too. Um, I can't thank enough our, our panelists. So all of all of you that have served as panelists, that's it's a lot of work, it's a lot of time, but we can't do our work if it wasn't for you. So we're really indebted to you. Um, and if you submit a proposal, please consider acting or serving as a panelist because um, we really do need folks that can um, that can really provide us feedback on the on the top notch signs that we receive. So please uh, please consider that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I do want to make sure that you um, keep in mind the future funding opportunities. So remember, you can always check through Inspires. Roses is released around mid-February um, of every year. Um, the RNES program and the TWISC, which are the two first two in those bullets, are rolling deadlines. One is specifically for um, unexpected events. The second one is for uh, workshops and symposia. Um, the uh, finest or the future investigators, it's also once a year. This is the student um, grants and uh, we've, we're still uh, we're about to make selections on those for this year. But keep an eye out because around February is it February of every year that they come out. So keep an eye. Keep an eye on that. Um, remote sensing of water quality. The due date is coming up in September and, and biodiversity also soliciting for a science team for the Bioscape field campaign, which is um, I think it's for 2023, and so those proposals are due in August. Next slide. On the horizon, um, there's not too much happening in 2022. Keep an eye for, for interdisciplinary science. Um, we will be soliciting for exports phase two. We will not do that until all the data that has been collected through exports is available um, to the entire community. We're starting with the level playing field, so it's important that everybody has the same access to those data um, in order for um, to compete for the phase two. So that is gonna come, it's probably not gonna be earlier than 2022, considering we're in 2021 and it's gonna take a while. Um, Arctic Colors might also be looking for a science definition team soon. So also keep an eye out for that. We'll make sure that we announce it broadly. Um, something to keep also in the back of your minds, PACE launching at the end, no earlier than the end of 2023. That means that we're gonna need um, field validations, and we're probably going to be soliciting them in Roses 23, so that is um, February of 2023. So keep an eye out for that. We will make sure that we announce it broadly as well, because um, that's we're expecting that to be a pretty big competition to address the needs of the new um, satellite going up. Um, and everything else is just going to be, you know, in a couple of years. Uh, next slide, and I think that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Can we please have our, our NOAA program managers on stage to begin slide sharing? Kathy, are you going first? Great. You just have to unmute. Yeah, I think I'm going first, right, Dwight? Looks good. Yeah, um, if, uh, if it's all the same to you, though, I'd, I'd like to run my own slides. That's I'd... great. Great, okay. I'm gonna talk really quickly. So um, you can see my slides okay? All right. The, I'm Kathy Tedesco. I'm a program manager in the NOAA Glo Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program, 
we became a program about a year ago. We were a division prior to that, so we were sort of elevated within NOAA. Um, we've just developed a new strategic plan that will be released this summer, and we have a new website. I didn't put anything in about the budget, but I can say that we've been flat funded for many years, and the president's 22 budget looks good for GOMO. It also looks good for the Arctic program, which is part of our um, part of GOMO. So you can't really see this map. It's very small, but GOMO supports over 1 million ocean observations per day. We support the ocean sites, um, repeat hydrography, Argo program, um, global drifter program, and a lot of unmanned or uncrewed surface vehicles. We have two upcoming events. We have a community workshop this summer. And then for Ocean Sciences, we're planning a town hall and a celebration in honor of 20 years of observing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk quickly, so I'm gonna skip through some stuff, but um, the highlights for the, for the um, Global Ocean Carbon observing network that GOMO supports, which is repeat hydrography and PCO2 from ships of opportunity and moorings. The new um, GOSHIP proposal from 21 to 26, it's a six year proposal, was recommended for funding by NSF and NOAA. And related to uh, COVID-19, we had GOSHIP A13 out there, they left South Africa, and then they were called back to the US due to COVID. So Leticia Barbaro was um, one of the chief scientists and she just did an amazing job under unknown circumstances. So they were still able to conduct eight CTD casts, deploy six SOCOM floats and 35 drifters. In addition, the underway systems were still functioning as, we, um, as the ship crossed back to the United States and we had Wei Jun Kai's Del C-13 DIC system going and um, there were bio go ship samples collected as well. We have, we're planning to redo A13-5 this winter. And in FY21, GOMO partnered with the Integrated Ocean Observing System, NASA, OBB, and OCB to fund a bio go ship pilot study to investigate the distribution and biogeochemical role of plankton in the global ocean. So six PIs were involved in that, in that project and they're funded to participate on three cruises over the next two years. And there's a cruise in the Atlantic, the Indian and the Pacific. Um, BioGoship has a new website on the bottom left and some upcoming events related to carbon are that we've discussed um, or I've discussed volunteering to host a bio go ship data requirements this fall. Um, I assume it's gonna be virtual though. And the Surface Ocean CO2 Network, um, we're planning a side event for ocean sciences. I'm planning it with Magic Telshevsky of IOCCP and hopefully Maria Hood of G7. We had a solicitation this year with the Climate Program Office. So the Climate Monitoring Program and the Climate Variability and Predictability Programs. And it was to increase the usefulness of NOAA OBS to the community. So several BGC um, projects were recommended for funding. The PIs have been informed, but the formal announcement will come out in the fall. The, we also support the TPOS um, 2020 project. So the Tropical Pacific Observing System is a multinational observing system. And TPOS 2020 is transitioning to TPOS. It's going from sort of a planning phase to an implementation phase. So the final report for TPOS 2020 is due out any day. And there's a new TPOS website, tropicalpacific.org. TPOS is actively seeking new members and new partners. And if you go to the new website, there's a drop down that says get involved. And there's a form that you can fill out to get involved. But the but the um, the ways that you can contribute are to contribute data or to contribute 
um, observations to the sustained observing system, or you could serve on a TPOS governance group like the Science Advisory Committee, Implementation Coordination Group, or there are two TPOS events coming up. One is at AGU on atmospheric modeling and one at Ocean Sciences for um, focused on observations and modeling. I'm almost done. Um, in FY19, GOMO and NASA OBB funded two awards to redesign BGC Argo profiling floats and improve the sensor technology. The one award was to Steve Reiser at UW in partnership with Ken Johnson at Ambari and Seabird, and the other Sarah Perky leads from Scripps, and she's working with MRV and Ambari. So the first triple oxygen float was deployed in November. On the left is a picture of the, of, of the three oxygen sensors. And the third one will be deployed by the Ocean Acidification Program on their West Coast cruise this summer. Um, the middle picture is the, the redesigned pH sensor that Ken Johnson's working on. There's some text there that you could read later. And the last thing is the Laura Lorenzoni and I are both co-chairs of the US GCRP Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group. And we're looking to the community for volunteers to help develop the next decadal U.S. carbon cycle science plan. So I've put in here the first report by Sarmiento and Wafsi from 99. The link is in there, I hope. And the next report came out in 2011, and that was Mikulak, Jackson, Marlin, and Sabine. You can um, reach out to me, reach out to Laura, reach out to Gami Shrestha's here somewhere. You could reach out to her and there's a Google form that you could fill out to nominate yourself or um, nominate somebody else to participate in the, as, or to serve as an author of the report. So take a look at the reports and see if it's something you're interested in, reach out to us. And this last slide is just the, the GOMO new website and my contact information. Thank you. Sorry, Dwight. No, you're good. Dwight, Dwight take all me. the time, take all the time you need, Dwight, to finish up. It's I okay. talked so fast. <laughs> you did talk fast. Thank you both. Um, so NOAA's Ocean Certification Program actually is celebrating it's 10 year anniversary this year. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, so over this past 10 years, we've coordinated and engaged transdisciplinary research across the agency in partnership with other federal agencies through the Interagency Working Group, NOA, and the CCIWG, which Kathy just mentioned, and internationally through the Global Ocean Certification Observing Network, or GOAN. So in response to the Federal Ocean Acidification Research and Monitoring Act, the OAP works to improve our understanding of how ocean acidification may be altering the nation's ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes, how these changes may impact the nation's living marine resources, and how these impacts could affect industries, fisheries, and communities. Uh, recently, the OAP led an effort across the agency in forging a research plan that lays out the regional priorities and actions that the agency is looking to take with respect to ocean acidification over the next decade or so. So I encourage all of you to take uh, pay a visit to our website where you can download the full PDF of this document and familiarize yourself with its content and all the priorities that are detailed within it. I believe uh, a great many of the actions that are reported have considerable intersection with the OCB community. So uh, a major investment of the program remains characterizing the chemical environment. Uh, core requirement under form has been maintaining, enhancing, and expanding the national observing capabilities designed to track and better understand ocean acidification and enhance our predictive capabilities of it. Our emphasis has been largely confined to within the U.S. coastal large marine ecosystems. So we work pretty closely and in tight partnership with GOMO, whereby uh, kind of the di divisional labor has fallen out where we're tightly focused in around the waters 
most relevant to our marine fisheries while GOMO is taking on the entire rest of the earth. So <laughs> kudos to you. Um, <laughs> So uh, much of the, the heart of the network is based around these fixed mooring systems, which are, many of you are familiar with, the MAP CO2 systems. It's important to note that these observing systems were originally uh, designed to track gas fluxes, gas exchange of CO2 uh, for doing carbon inventories. As a result, they are not optimally suited for characterizing the full carbonate system of the whole water column. So there have been efforts in recent years to figure out how we can operationally augment these systems uh, to accommodate that subsurface environment in a robust fashion, which I think is a challenge. In coming years, we are investing on, in an enhancement to the system to allow us to have a moored autonomous DIC system uh, shown here. That's going to allow for the full characterization of the carbonate system. Right now, we rely um, in large part on autonomous pH sensors, which have not demonstrated uh, significant robustness in most applications, whereby while they produce good data, uh, they, their failure rate is considerably higher than the MAP CO2 at this point. So we're hoping that the, that the more DIC system will prove more robust. To complement the fixed more time series, we have a, a we invest a number of um, we invest in a number of different platforms which that are ship-based. One is an autonomous uh, underway system, which is also uh, done in coordination with GOMA, where again, GOMA covers a lot of the global environment and we cover areas that tend to be much more exclusively located where our fisheries are. Um, in addition to that, OAP sponsors quadrennial surveys of uh, the coastal large marine ecosystems at least those south of Bering Sea anyway. Uh, we didn't have any this past uh, fiscal year as a result of COVID-19. So we are backlogged. So the West Coast Ocean Acidification Cruise, which was originally expected to go out last year, is in fact about to go out any day now, I believe. It will be immediately followed by the GOMEC Cruise, the Gulf of Mexico Cruise. Um, Increasingly, these surveys are including a transdisciplinary uh, portfolio of research beyond just three-dimensional characterization of the biogeochemistry. Um, GOMEC, for example, is going to be including eDNA work as well. And next year, we're going to be executing uh, the next iteration of the East Coast Ocean Acidification Cruise, or ECOA. So I encourage those who are interested in, in coordinating on this front to reach out to the chief scientists of that. That uh, Joe Salisbury's group out of UNH is, is largely leading uh, the science coordination for the Gulf of Maine region, and Wei Jun Kai at University of Delaware is in charge of overseeing a lot of the science requirements for the region south of that. Oh, I just wanted to mention that all of this data, um, with a latency of approximately two years, can be expected for quality assurance. But after that, it should all be accessible. And you can go to our website to the Ocean Certification Data Stewardship Project led by Li Kang Jang out of uh, NCI. And you should be able to access any of that data. So um, fully describing the marine chemical environment in response to acidification does not alone provide us with the requisite understanding needed to assess the national vulnerability of ocean acidification. Ultimately, we must derive strategic actionable information for resource managers and relevant industries. That means it is at least as important that we determine the marine species responses to any changes we may be detecting or projecting uh, to occur and to work better to better understand what, if any, observed changes at the population level might be attributable to ocean acidification. OAP sponsors experimental studies of the effects of ocean acidification at NOAA fishery science centers across the nation from Fairbanks, Alaska to Narragansett, Rhode Island, where they're engaged in working to understand the adaptation or acclimation for a potential, um, a potential for a range of marine organisms relevant to NOAA's admission space, from primary producers to forage fish. Increasingly, these studies have examined OA in the context of multiple stressors, which are likely to co-occur uh, with increasing acidification. We expect that this trend will continue. In terms of competitive awards, the broad requirements needed to fully assess the nation's potential 
Vulnerability to continued acidification transcends the purely in-house capabilities of the agency. And the academic community brings critically needed expertise to our research portfolio to help us better meet the mission requirements. Since the program inception, OAP has partnered across the agency with other NOAA programs to encourage inclusion of OA science as part of their competitive portfolio, leveraging their resources, and effectively expanding NOAA's OAP investment to competitive research grants well beyond that of our appropriated resources to the program. I can't detail all of these in the available time I have right now, but the topics have ranged from lab and field experiments and modeling studies, examining ecosystem impacts to OA, to transitioning new observing technologies in support of affected industries, such as the shellfish aquaculture industry. More recently, we've worked with Sea Grant to more tightly link the academic research community with shellfish aquaculture industry through joint research partnership. So over time, the OAP investments to competitive awards has significantly grown. And increasingly, we've been offering up more targeted calls explicit to our own program research interest, but maintaining a strong partnership with an increasing number of NOAA programs across the agency. So I would encourage you to keep a lookout on our website where we announce new funding opportunities and recognize that not all OAP sponsored funding is necessarily coming through our program itself, but is actually in partnership with a range of other programs across the agency. Last year, despite all the limitations imposed by COVID-19, the OAP and the NOAA National Center for Coastal Ocean Science Competitive Research Program jointly convened a virtual workshop examining the state of science with respect to ocean acidification and how it might intersect with harmful algal blooms. The workshop found that future research needs to be increasingly holistic in their approach and to ensure that neither HABs nor OA be considered in isolation of co-occurring changes which are unfolding in the ocean. They also concluded that with sufficient advances in our understanding how OA and related processes might alter the occurrence and manifestation of HABs, there is a great opportunity to potentially offer up a range of products that can inform HAB prediction models and regional vulnerability assessments. The tech memo for this from this workshop uh, should be available on our OAP website in the next coming weeks, and we fully anticipate that the outcomes from this workshop will inform a joint OAP and cost funding opportunity this fall. OAP has also been a partnering sponsor for the Interlaboratory Comparison Studies, Advanced Data Scripts Institution by the Dixon Lab, which many of you may have participated in. We're currently in dialogue with Andrew with regards to the possibility of executing the next iteration of these studies in coming years, once we're beyond the COVID-19 induced backlog of CO2 reference materials. On a related note, I'd like to point out that as part of this OCB workshop next Tuesday, there will be a discussion with Andrew and members of the IWGOA regarding the future planning for these CO2 and seawater reference materials, the details of which you can find in the agenda. And it includes a community survey and a bit of a pre-discussion homework, which I encourage you all to partake in. So I think with that, I will take questions. I will note from a funding perspective, OAP has enjoyed roughly a million dollar a year increase in appropriation since its inception. And uh, in FY and uh, FY twenty one, this fiscal year, we were enacted at fifteen and a half million, um, thanks to all the fantastic work you as a community are engaged in. So, thanks. Thank you all so much for these presentations. I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of questions given the attendance. Um, I would ask that all of our agency representatives please come back on stage with your cameras on. You can keep yourself muted unless you're speaking. Um, please enter your questions into the Q&A. We're going to allow three, 30 minutes for this. So if, if we eat a little bit into our networking time, we'll extend that time. Um, if, if people are engaged in conversations, um, we, we are happy to extend the networking time. But right now, we, we feel it's important to, to provide this 30 minutes if people would like it. So I'm going to monitor the Q&A. So if people have questions, it would be helpful if you, if you are targeting a certain agency or a particular agency representative to let us know that when you ask the question. And if any agency managers have any comments or questions for each other or any further comments, please feel free to, to jump in. 
I raised my hand. Can I can I say something? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. No, I just I forgot to actually um, make make emphasis on this, but I really want the community to um, to know this so that they can kind of keep an eye out. Uh, one of the things that I, I think we're proudest of um, in the ocean biology and biogeochemistry program is that we partner with MUREP um, in a recent competition specifically focused on ocean. Um, and uh, uh, we had a couple of questions. We, we wanted to look at um, ecological changes and then um, some changes in the carbon cycle. Um, and this solicitation was, was very um, specific in that not only it addressed the science relevant to OBB, but it also addressed the interests of the MUREP uh, program, which um, really is trying to engage and incorporate more into the science the underrepresented um, groups and minorities. Um, and we had we had a really nice set of, of proposers come forward, and uh, I think I think it was it's success. We're going to be able to see it down the road um, as as we really um, build a more diverse community. So we, it's really difficult to say now we were successful, um, but the plans that we were put forward were really really good and solid, and we all felt as as if this is going to be a really great investment. Um, so just just as a heads up to the community, look out because we really want to promote these kinds of um, opportunities to really entrain uh, more underrepresented groups into our sciences. And we understand that, you know, ocean sciences is not is not the most diverse group. I mean, it's we're fortunate that that um, females are, you know, look, look at us in this panel. You know, we're fortunate that females are are being more represented, but still. In our program, it's about 25% of PIs are females, and we really need to to boost that. And um, if we go into other, um, you know, racial groups, is you know, let's not even talk about it because it's 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 embarrassed. And so we really have to do um, a, a better job at in training minorities. And so we were really proud of this, and I um, I wanted to highlight that um, selections on that solicitation should be coming out by the end of this month. Thanks, Heather. Laura, I think that programs like that are really important for starting to develop these longer term relationships with minority serving institutions to to bring more people into the ocean sciences. I think that those investments, those initial investments are building bridges to minority serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, um, tribal universities, tribal colleges. I think those are really important links and it takes somebody to to open those doors. And so I, I think that our agency managers are working really hard to, to start to build those relationships. Um, Kathy Tedesco has asked that you add a link to the, I guess the Ocean Murit, Murit program in the chat. And since we're on the topic of diversity, I am adding a link to the Jedi Jamboard because we are really wanting talk about this um, moving forward as a community um, about engaging broader groups in the ocean sciences and OCB and the ocean sciences more broadly. Um, and so I have a jam board that we are using. Um, we're using it, we used it in our diversity discussions last uh, Friday, I think it was. And then we're also using it um, in the networking space. You'll notice if you go to the first floor it is all DEI topics or Jedi, Jedi topics, um, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, and they're all different topics, but they all link to this Jamboard. And we want to use this as a brainstorming space, as a community to help people at the individual level, at the institution level, and as a broad network like OCB or agencies. This is a really great space to, to share ideas about diversifying the ocean sciences. So there's that link there. Watching the Q&A, usually this is a free for all, but I think everybody is being shy. Here we go. All right, Tatiana Reinerson, a question for Mike Seraki. Given that biological oceanography has dropped target deadlines for proposals, any advice on how we should plan start dates vis-a-vis -vis proposal submission date? Six months, talk to the program manager. So thank you, Tatiana. We're, um working these things out and um, we don't want to have uh, fixed dates for proposals because that having no deadline. So 
basically our approach is going to be to accumulate proposals up to a certain number and when we have that number then we will plan a panel so we expect that there's the possibility looking at how other programs have managed this some some um proposals get decisions a little bit quicker and some might get a little bit later than what we had in the past so um if you have a particular uh start date you know we're still working on a six month uh decision for most of our the majority of our proposals so you can think about that or if you have like a particular critical date uh relative to a cruise opportunity or seasonal effect or something um you could talk to a program officer about about timing so to add to that tatiana the consideration if you plan to go to sea um is also uh, ship scheduling and uh, if far ahead you need to submit proposals to request ship times, particularly global ships, hasn't changed. So we don't have a, a target date any longer in BioOsh, but OCE itself um, needs, I think, I think it's 18 months actually, I'm not, it's either 12 months or 18 months for global class ships. So that might um, help you decide the lead time you need for any given proposal. Yeah, it's 18 months for large ships. I would also add, I mean, just so that people don't get that in their head that, so six months has always been a pretty unrealistic time frame for us actual start date, even for those of us who still have target dates. Six months is a good target for us to complete the job of the review process and getting the decision out for you. So um, so something a little longer than that is is a bit more comfortable. Thank you. We've got another question here with four upvotes. And I love this question. I was one of the upvotes. Since we had our negative emissions carbon capture discussion this morning, can the programs comment on whether or not they intend to fund research into those questions? If I can comment a little bit from the NOAA perspective. Uh, right now, we have a CDR task force that's forged within the agency, it's largely from the OIR perspective, but we have participation from across the agency. And our intent is we're drafting a plan to detail where CDR fits within NOAA's mission space. Right now, there is not a program explicitly you know, aligned with the requirements under CDR, but NOAA has a considerable amount of relevant, both uh, observing and modeling capabilities that it could bring to bear on it, but we have not gotten explicit language from Congress to engage on this front at this point. So um, we're in the process of trying to at least develop internally where we think NOAA's mission space plays in this, and we don't envision that, that it would be implementing CDR, but we see a, ma a significant role with respect to us evaluating the efficacy and of, uh, of some of the CDR claims and evaluating if there are co-benefits or unforeseen risk that might be associated on the marine environment. Um, so we're, we are at least internally engaged in, in developing plans for CDR, but we do not as yet have any such program that's tasked with it. Do NSF or NASA want to comment on this one? I, I, I'll Sorry, Mike, did you want to first? No, go ahead, Laura. Um, all, all I'll say is, um, and it's funny because I just looked at the at the chat and, and um, there was a you know reference to research itself. And I think that's where NASA's interest lay. Um, certainly we're not um, we're not going to be looking at um, specific anything specific in terms of you know geoengineering or anything like that. Uh, we're very interested in understanding how our, our system or ocean um, a coastal vegetation, all of that actually naturally captures and cycles carbon, and that's why we have already targeted solicitations that look at um, carbon cycling across a variety of interfaces, um, and we'll certainly continue to support that kind of research. So we're um, we're coming at it from the from the kind of the natural research side. That doesn't mean that we're not keeping our thumb on it, um, and we'll continue to monitor um, some of the discussions and where we can contribute to the science, we'll continue to do that. Um, and that also includes our carbon monitoring system um, solicitation and program that's that's pretty robust and specifically addresses um, 
you know how carbon how carbon is being is being cycled through a variety of systems more on the application side and i'll just say something uh hetty can i go uh just uh there hasn't been specific conversations yet in nsf about this that i'm aware of at our level but we do are aware of a national academy report that's due out uh, within the next few months that probably will provide guidance on priorities in this area so pay attention to that and like i said pay attention to the uh u.s global change climate change um, research program so eddie yeah so i would um just add to the kind of watch this space um you know where some things might not fall within the basic research purview of the chemical and biological oceanography programs they might cross over into other parts of nsf um, including engineering and um the as the potential new technology application directorate comes into being that that might be a, a space to watch so so to answer the question you know are we planning to fund proposals well no not right now but um you know these are conversations and, and things to watch and cynthia put a link in the chat relevant to what following up on what mike and hetty especially hetty just said I, I just wanted to add that the USGCRP Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group is collecting information from all the federal agencies on what activities they have ongoing that might be relevant for CDR. So um, uh, we're, we're just, you know, we're still developing the database. We don't even have all responses from NOAA yet, but we're, we're reaching out to all the agencies. So it's, it's not just marine CDR it's terrestrial also. Those lines, I just wanted to shout out that John Dodd put a link in the chat for the DOE CDR opportunity. Um, there's a lot of terrestrial in that. I think there's a little bit of marine, but I think it's largely terrestrial. Go ahead, Mete. Oh, oh we can't hear you. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> You can try reloading your browser, Mete. It'll kick you out and it'll bring you back in. Or you can type in the chat. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll go say ahead. very quickly. So the DOE um, group has reached out to NOAA to see if there are people from the NOAA task force who are interested in participating in the um, the marine related issues. Jessica's posting some great information in the chat here as well. Jessica Cross, so please, I, I think Mente's having difficulty connecting or getting his mic working. With Laura earlier, right? Yeah, she switched laptops and things got better. <laughs> oh, and Hetty has already answered the OOI relocation question. Thank you, Hetty. The, the announcement says the move will take place in 2024 from for the Pioneer Array moving to the Mid-Atlantic Bight. All right, back to the Q&A. Let's see here. Other questions? We still have 15 minutes left. This is a unique opportunity to talk with your program managers all at the same time. I know that, as I said earlier, before the session started, that, that carbon dioxide removal research, um, really trying to underpin the science um, for some of these technologies is something that OCB is thinking 
seriously about and how it can support its community to pursue this kind of research before this stuff starts moving forward without scientific engagement. Um, and so we wanted to wait because I know there are, there's a NOAA task force, there's the academies has a, a synthesis activity that's ongoing. So we want to maintain a dialogue with NASA, NOAA and NSF and, and then DOE perhaps about how to, how OCB can best support the community on this, um, be it, you know, new research areas, uh, working groups focused on particular uh, technology approaches, whatever it might be. So please be thinking about that both as a community and as our agency supporters about, you know, how, how OCB can facilitate this. Um, Jessica, I see there's the internal task force. The DOE is leading a congressionally mandated interagency task force. Um, Yes, she put the link in for the National Academies panel, and I highly recommend. We're trying to advertise all of their events, their talks. They're they're having um, regular meetings uh, focused around different topics, and I highly recommend joining those meetings if you can. And they put the recordings online afterwards, so you can follow what's going on with that group. Um, other industry. Oh, we've got another question. Let's see. With the recent increased focus on uh, a Jedi, how have your review processes adapted? This looks like a question for everybody. It sounds like I think Laura kind of started to address that in her remarks, but definitely all of you can take a shot at this. I can I can add. Um, uh, it's it's interesting because there. Um, we've always strived in terms of review to have a balanced. Um, a balance, balanced panels, and I think that's the case for every every agency here. So we want to make sure that our panels we have, um, you know, gender balance, we have career balance, um, and obviously diversity. Um, we've struggled, especially with the latter one, um, and so we're we're making an active effort to link um, now. You know, for instance, um, we we scour through um, the the Europe institutions and try to recruit panelists from from minority serving institutions, and so we're making. Um, a true um, conscious and active effort to try to have a more balance in our panels. Um, but I'll tell you one thing, it's, it's been a little bit of a struggle um, and we recognize there are a variety of reasons why um, there could be some barriers in um, recruiting some panelists from, from MSIs. And um, I myself would absolutely welcome um, feedback from the community. I would love it if um, folks from minority serving institutions would reach out to us and say, hey, um, we'd love to serve on panels. Um, we actively try to recruit panelists, and it's it's um, sometimes it's a challenge. And just so everybody knows, uh, you don't need to have a PhD to serve on a NASA panel if you have a, a master's degree. And the reason I bring it up is because a lot of um, MSIs um, don't um, you go all the way to PhD. That's totally fine. Um, you're still an expert in your field. You're still a, a scientist, um, and we would love to have you on the panel. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, we really, really, really um, are trying to make a, a conscious effort to really have higher diversity in our panels. I would, uh, Laura said, in our at the at the ground level of the review panel process, it's important for us to. Um, not only do we alert our panel to implicit bias as part of our introduction and training, we also try to have as diverse a, a group as possible in our reviewer community and in our panel. So that's areas in terms of just the review process, which is what the question was of how we're moving. Uh, the other part that's a little related is um, our hiring practices in NSF we're looking at closely in terms of getting more diversity on our in our programs in our on our program officers um those are the kinds of things uh we're doing there are other uh diversity related activities uh, we have specific programs and uh supplements available for minority serving institutions we are uh working on training workshops for improving the quality of minority serving 
uh, institutions. Um, so there's a, a range of things that are sort of going on both behind the scenes. And I think also there will be new initiatives coming out that you'll, if you're paying attention at NSF to see about. Anyone else want to comment on that, Hetty or Cynthia? I, I have a couple comments about um, accessibility and that one thing that I think that we have observed in running panels during COVID, well, first of all, um, we really appreciate, I think like Laura said, that the community has been kind of stepping up to serve. Um, but in terms of accessibility, uh, one of the things we're hearing with remote panels is that uh, it allows a wider portion of the community to participate, especially those that that have a hard time traveling. So um, we're learning a lot as we go that I think can help inform our processes going forward to make sure that we can engage as many folks as possible in our processes. And um, so that that's, a I think, a good thing that came out of the last year for us. Um, and again, again, a plug, if you're interested, volunteer to serve on panels. Um, we are doing our best to diversify of not very diverse community. That's an excellent point, Cynthia. Thanks for remembering that. Um, the other thing I would add is that, you know, the, the question was about observations about our review process. And of course our review process involves not only us, but our reviewers. Um, and I'd say one of the things I've observed is my first panelist as an NSF program officer was 12 years ago. And at that time in our introductory panel remarks, my then division director was saying, you know, pay attention, you know, if you spot something that's opportunity for broadening participation, call it out, et cetera. I mean, we, we've been trying to do it. And I'd say one of the observations that I've seen about our process recently is that reviewers and panelists really are paying attention. So not only are we paying some more attention, but I'm actually seeing reviewers calling out opportunities and, you know, given um, identifying missed opportunities and also identifying, you know, real standout broader impacts. So I'd say, um, you know, that I'm looking at the other side of the coin, um, we're seeing more engagement from the review community in evaluating this as an aspect of our process. So um, the recent solicitation that I on with the um, climate program office they implemented a requirement that they put in a statement and it most of the statements showed that they were aware of their university um, jedi statements or how this project would um, address different issues and it was sort of like a the the review panel didn't really they didn't rank it they just saw that it was there and saw how engaged the PIs were. I don't know if that's, if NOAA has done that or if it was just the client who's implemented that. So, I mean, certainly there's a lot of top level, you know, emphasis in trying to ensure we have this, but it, it does seem to be happening at sort of the organization by organization sub-levels of, of NOAA. Um, I would say that increasingly, like our most recent panel that we had, you know, usually that diversity and inclusion statement is just sort of thrown in there as lip service and everybody acknowledges it's there. But I am absolutely seeing a convicted um, emphasis by the panel itself to ensuring that it, there's actually some substance to it. So it is no longer sufficient to just simply say, yep, we've checked that box. There has to be has there has to be some demonstrated action or effort reflected in the proposal itself that shows that there's some meaningful engagement on that front. So but, um, had more discussion were that one of the PI was on the board or established the guide the guidelines for their university or things like that. I see Mete made a comment. Yeah, Mete's comment goes back to, to um, the carbon dioxide removal, geoengineering research, and, and the fact that 
there doesn't need to be a special call in NSF to submit a proposal, you know, if it's relevant, if physical oceanographic processes are needed to better understand the, the efficacy of, of a CDR approach, then it would be, you know, worth reaching out to the program manager. And then I asked about, you know, in my mind, the typical CDR proposals probably going to span biological, chemical, and physical oceanography, and possibly other programs or even divisions in NSF. And what the what the likelihood is of you know joint review or joint panels or how that would work because these are really, really strongly interdisciplinary proposals. Say as with Mete's previous answer, I mean our processes don't change. You know, if you if you have a core physical oceanography proposal that's relevant to this topic, you would submit it to them. If it's a if it's a cross disciplinary proposal, you know, we'll still we'll co review it just like we always have. Yeah, just we have a, just speak, oh, just sorry, this, go. oh I'm sorry, I was just going to speak to the say you know that's a, key, a a clear distinction between the agencies and that NSF is bottom up and places like NOAA tend to be top down. So we're eagerly trying to in, ensure we get some top down direction for us as an agency as NOAA to ensure we can engage on this front. We have absolute capacity to bring to it and uh, it isn't to say that we're not entertaining various activities with it, but we really are um, awaiting some, some top down direction and unlike NSF, which they can just act on it. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, um, which is here. Are there large scale efforts the ocean science community should be involved in, but is not? And she cites the 10 big ideas as an example. Are there, are there big ideas that the ocean sciences community is not engaging with that they should be? I think our community is amazingly adaptable and um, opportunistic at finding uh, ways to get funding in NSF. We try to highlight areas where we see um, uh, new uh, opportunities and um, it's amazing how well our community does in these programs. Um, so I'm not thinking of anything that comes quickly to mind that we're sort of missing out on. I think. Um, uh, I don't know, Cynthia, do you have anything or Hetty? Just, I would say just to reiterate earlier advice to kind of watch this space. I don't remember who said it. Um, I, I would say this administration is remarkably hearteningly interested in climate change. And I think um, paying attention to what's coming out of the USCRP is going to be a really uh, good idea for the community in the coming years or, uh, year or so. And I'm, you know, I think we're all hopeful there'll be some new opportunities there. Any uh, any NOAA folks want to comment on that or? Okay, so Jessica put a question in the chat here if the agencies and, and Cynthia might have kind of answered this if the agencies are waiting on the the Academy's report or other Keystone reports or things that are coming out in this coming year if the agencies are waiting on the Academy's report for some community guidance would you recommend that OCB also wait for that report before engaging with carbon dioxide removal or carbon removal strategy research is it too early for us to solicit support for OCB activities the OCB solicitation will be released later this summer, just FYI. So if too early you're talking about like a couple months, then yeah, if you if you can wait a few months for those reports to come out, this, the CDR space is really huge. And you know, we saw that in the presentations this morning and there's a whole lot of areas where uh, people could ask for funding. We're sort of looking for the National Academy um, to uh, give us priorities on that, and so from a, uh, that's sort of how we would we would proceed. I don't. That's how I interpret that. Can I step back for one second? I just um, 
I just realized, so the large scale effort, it's not about the 10 big ideas, but some of the stuff that was in my talk, especially the TPOS program, there's a, there's, there was a BGC working group um, led by Pete Stratton and, and Adrian Sutton. So in the, re, in the previous reports, there are a lot of recommendations for what needs to be implemented regarding BGC in the tropical Pacific. So uh, several of the things that I, that I shared are ways to get involved. They're not as big as the 10 big ideas, but like Pacific is a limited um, observing network, but I just wanted to remind people that that was in there. So uh, Jessica said that two months might be actually be a whole year relative to the OCB solicitations. So um, I, do you want to answer that, Heather? I mean, it, it sort of depends on if you, um, clearly there are better experts on in the CDR space than me, and maybe you can preordain what the priority research areas are going to be in that report. and. Maybe the National Academy process has identified those in some way, and you have a clear idea of what might be coming out in the report. And then um, if you put in a proposal to OCB for a working group, and then you're lucky and it aligns with their priorities, or you, you've figured it out, I guess, I guess that could work. I, that's my first off reaction. Um, yeah, so we have an SSC member who is on that committee, and, and I think that we can work with them to, to see what the emerging priorities are and get a sense of the timelines. And, and because, you know, OCB is a pretty nimble, adaptive, flexible model, I think that, you know, we can, we can adjust as needed. I, I hate to think about waiting another whole year if this report's coming out in two or three months. So something to be thinking about. Yeah, I, I guess I was being flip in saying that, and I was thinking more about our funding cycle. And um. mm. Okay, um, it looks like we are out of time. Um, let me see, I think one, had, one last question had come in, but I can't find it right now. Oh, the UN decade. Yes, the UN decade just endorsed 50 ocean decade programs, and and that link has been put out everywhere. Um, and it's it's also on Twitter. It's on the OCB feed, so you can take a peek at that and see what has been endorsed. Um, but she's asking, how do the agencies think about these endorsements with respect to their priorities? And this will be the last question, and then we'll go to networking. <laughs> Thank you actively involved with those developing the um, proposals. NSF OCE adopted five, nominated five of them. The right now though like with the oasis program that megan cronin put in and got support um we're now sort of wondering where all the ship time comes from and things like that to actually implement the the projects kathy would it be helpful if i share the tpos 2020 report link in the chat um, I did. I did add a comment. I forgot to mention this. Atlantos uh, was just made a, an official goose program. So um, I don't know that much about it, but they're trying to. There are a lot of regional studies in the Atlantic, and they're they're sort of trying to integrate um, all those projects into you know some some strategic plan for the atlantic ocean and meridional overturning circulation and everything else um so that was about two weeks ago it, it was um it was adopted as a goose program which means that more more um countries 
will probably get involved in that activity. All right. Oh, it is. Oh, that's right. It's Tropical Atlantic. Sorry. Tropical Pacific. Network. Tropical Pacific. Oh, my God. I'm really, really oh, tired. I had a typo anyway. So. That's easy to, to remember. Tropicalpacific.org. OK. Um, all right. Thank you all so much for taking the time to put your slides together and, and share these updates and to take the questions. Um, we are going to wrap this up. And we would ask that everybody please join us in the networking space. Um, we will keep it open um, until two o'clock if possible. Um, and there are, I think some of our agency managers might be able to be at the agency space on floor six if you have additional questions um, and use the networking uh, directory to navigate the, the networking spaces. Like I said, all eight floors, there's stuff to see everywhere and conversations to be had. So thank you very much.